Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with over 167 episodes broadcast on NBC Radio from 1949 to 1953, we bring to you Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble, but... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to end up with a guy I'm looking for shoving a gun in my back and me doing my best to help him. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Well, where do I go this time? I'm not sure. You're not? (laughs) Let's have that again. You heard me. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. So what do I do when I get there? I don't know. Now, wait a minute. You're not sure where I'm going. You don't know what I'm supposed to do when I get there. Well, okay, if you want to play 20 questions, is it animal, vegetable, or mineral? Mineral. And I'll save you the other 19 questions by telling you it's a buzz bomb. Buzz bomb? Steve, I'm sure you remember how proficient the Nazis were in the last war with buzz bombs. Yeah. As I remember, they sure remodeled the London skyline with them. That's right. Perhaps you also remember that we had strong indications that the Nazis had a complete set of plans for a new buzz bomb. One which apparently is equal or superior to the guided missiles we're working on right now. Those plans disappeared, and we've had no line on them whatsoever up until last night. What happened last night? For some time, one of our agents in Berlin has been on the trail of a man he was convinced was involved. Last night, in an alley, he finally found the man with a knife in his back. Uh, So now we don't have any more line on it than before. I wouldn't say that. You see, the dying man lasted long enough to admit that he and a friend of his had stolen the plans around the time of the fall of Berlin. Did he say who his friend was? A man named Frelich, who brought them to this country right afterward. Their scheme was to sell to the highest bidder, but the dying man hadn't heard from Frelich since he came to the States five years ago. Five years ago? Well, why hasn't Frelich tried to peddle the plans before now, then? We don't know. That's what I want you to find out after you find Froelich. And Steve, remember that whoever killed Froelich's partner in Berlin knows as much about it as we do. That means from now on, it's going to be a race. Every minute counts double. Get on it, Steve. Locate Froelich wherever he is. And above all, bring back the data on that buzz bomb. Yeah, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just a simple matter of locating a guy named Frelick who came to this country almost five years ago and getting some buzz bomb plans away from him. On the surface, it sounds just dandy, but there are a couple of little things that occur to me real quick. In the first place, Frelick obviously doesn't want to be found. And in the second place, there's already been one murder committed over those plans. That means I've got to try to prevent the second one, namely my own. I head for the immigration office and start checking their files. Five hours later, I find a record of Frelick docking at New York, May 13th, 1946. I head for New York to follow it up. The local office digs out the file for me, and I find that Frelick listed as his next of kin a cousin named Julius Sachs in the Bronx. I copy down the address and go over. Yeah? Julius Sachs? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, 
What happened to you? Your face looks like you'd tangled with a meat grinder. What a fair set of yours. Who are you? Hey, you better take a look at my credentials. <clears throat> I see. Come in, please. Now then, what can I do for you, Mr. Mitchell? I'd like to talk to your cousin. My cousin? Yeah, Frelick. But I'm afraid you're much too late for that. You mean he skipped town? No, I mean Frelick has been dead for almost five years. What? Yeah. He was killed in a traffic accident the day after his boat docked from Europe. Oh, great. There goes my one lead. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, skip it. Look, uh, did Frelick ever mention anything to you about any valuable papers he had? No. You know, it's strange that you two should ask this question. What do you mean, me too? You observe the condition of my face. Well, last night I was almost beaten to death. My cries for help drove my attacker away and saved my life. Who was he? I do not know. I've never seen him before. A man with bulging eyes. He kept asking me strange questions about Frehley's papers. Questions which I was unable to answer. Brother, they're sure not losing any time. Hey, look, Frehley must have brought some luggage with him. Yeah, a trunk. I kept it in the attic for some time. You still have it? No. Last month I cleaned out the attic. When I came to the trunk, I realized I'd misplaced the key. So I sold the trunk. To whom? To a junk dealer. Uh, oh, fine. Great chance I'll have of finding it now. But, hmm. uh, But, uh, what could be so valuable about Furley's trunk? It was empty. And... You sure about that? Of course. Furley unpacked all of his clothes as soon as he arrived. What did you do with his clothes after he was killed? Oh, I gave them away. Uh, well, that settles that. Of course, those papers would be too bulky to hide them in clothing, anyway. What papers are these that everybody is suddenly so interested in? Oh, skip it. Look, Julius... Do you remember which junk dealer you sold the trunk to? Oh, yeah. I copy as it's down, if you like. I like. Uh, remember what the trunk looked like? Well, let me see. Uh, oh, it had a rounded top, as I remember, and uh, brass bands. Uh, not much to go on, but I'll give it a whirl. Mr. Mitchell, I still do not understand why this trunk is so important to you. Maybe it isn't, Julius, but I won't know until I find it. But this junk dealer, he's undoubtedly sold the trunk by now. And to find one trunk in a city as large as New York... Yeah, well... yeah, I know, Julius. If I ever bet with odds that heavy against me at the racetrack, I'd be on relief. Trunks, trunks. Have I got trunks, he asks. Mister, does a fish have scales? <laughs> Come with me. Huh? Hey, where are we going? To the back room here. You're going to see trunks. There. Oh, no. At least 50 of them. <laughs> 52, friend. Hey, take your pick. Two bucks each. Three bucks with keys. Look, the one I'm interested in, you bought about a month ago from a guy named Julius Sachs. You happen to remember it? Uh, mister, in my business, is not the names that count. It's the merchandise. Sack, schmack, sack. Well, this merchandise had a rounded cover and brass bands. Oh, an old baby, huh? Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I, I get a lot like it with it. Hey, wait a minute. You remember it? Hey, it seems to me I sold a trunk like that about three weeks ago. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember. Now, I had a couple of keys made for it, and I sold it to a doll down in Greenwich Village. Let's see, uh, 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 yeah, Alice Chambers. I thought uh, you didn't remember names. Hey, mister, you see her, you'll remember her name, too. You uh, happen to know where she lives in the village? Uh, a room and house, I think she said. Uh-huh, okay, thanks. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Hey, what's the matter? So you come in here asking about trunks. I give you a good price, two bucks, three mm. bucks with keys. And all you're fishing for is a doll's address. Hey, you know, this sort of thing does not help me further my career. <laughs> okay, career boy. Here's five bucks. Have a couple of trunks on me. Uh, with keys? Yeah. Yeah, here's another buck. With keys. So I head for Greenwich Village. I know what I'm following is strictly a hunch, and I'm just hoping the hunch doesn't turn into a wild goose tear. Steve Mitchell, government agent, shagging around New York after a beat-up, second-hand trunk yet. When I get to the village, the usual array of characters are floating around. A gent on the curb, carving statues out of soap. A guy with hair down to his shoulders, sawing away at a fiddle. The works. I nose around, inquiring about Alice Chambers. Finally, I learn that her rooming house is just around the corner. I turn the corner. Then I spot a crowd in front of the doorway with a couple of cops pushing them back. On the edge of the crowd stands a tall, skinny gent wearing a long black beard Alice! and a long white toga. She looked awful. She looked terrible. Excuse me, I'd like to get by. Ah, oh, my friend, you disappoint me. Huh? As I watched you approach, I thought, here is a man of character. 
Surely he will not stoop to this. Yet here you are, yielding to the same morbid curiosity which is the common denominator of the ignoramuses which our crass and materialistic culture spews forth upon our sidewalks in ever-increasing multitudes. Look, save the lecture, Professor. Ah, I, I... I do not remember making your acquaintance, yet you seem familiar with the title which my earnest but unfortunately too few students have bestowed upon me. Ah, just psychic, I guess. Hey, uh, what's going on, anyway? Uh, merely another unfortunate instance of man's inhumanity to man. Will you skip the double talk? Hey, does Alice Chambers live in this rooming house? A very profound question, my friend. What's so profound about it? A question which has occupied the minds of philosophers and theologians for centuries. Whither doth the soul take flight when the body... Soul? Body? Hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about? This Alice Chambers... What about her? It would appear that at some time during the course of the night, she was murdered. So all of a sudden, the trail's heating up fast. Now I know my hunch was right, that the trunk is pretty important. That means just one thing. A false bottom and in the secret compartment, the plans for the buzz bomb. I shove past the professor into the rooming house and check with the police. We give Alice Chambers' room a fast frisk, but no trunk. That puts me right back where I started from, which is nowhere. I turn to leave, but out in the hall, I spot the professor, Toga and all, heading for the next room. I catch up with him at the door. Ah, my friend of the morbid curiosity. Yeah, and speaking of same, I noticed you were right there in the crowd taking it all in, professor. I, sir, am a spectator of life. You uh, live here next door to Alice Chambers' room, huh? As you see. It is an humble abode, but it serves me. After all, life is of the mind, not the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I'd like a little information. You have indeed come to the right man, my friend. Oh? Yes. To some, it is given to build things. To others, it is given to tear them down. But to me, has been granted the highest function. That of spreading you a little... You couldn't have used a better word, Professor. Sir? Oh, skip it. Yes, yes. As I was saying, if I can but momentarily pierce the black cloud of ignorance with the pure light of knowledge, then I feel that this humble life shall not have been lived in vain. Then how about piercing my ignorance? If it were not for one thing, I would be delighted, sir. Oh, what do you mean? Well, I, <clears throat> unfortunately, suffer from a delicate condition of the throat. To impart information, I am required to speak at length. This has a tendency to uh, dry out the sensitive throat membranes, and thus I... I, I uh, get it, I get it, okay. Is there a bar around here? Uh, strange that you should ask, because there does happen to be a delightful place but a few paces down the block, a haven where the weary traveler may find refuge and refreshment. Well, that's the fanciest description of a saloon I've ever heard, but come on, let's go. I'm afraid that is quite impossible at the moment, my friend. What? Now, look. Indeed, for me to stir from this very spot at the moment would be to defy various laws of physics. And, of course, there is the matter of modesty also. Modesty? Look, what are you talking about? Boil it down, will you? Uh, very well. To reduce it to the vernacular, you are standing on my toga. <laughs> So, this is the quiet haven for the weary traveler, huh? Is it not delightful? Professor, I've got to hand it to you. You've got a great imagination. Now, look, are your tonsils oiled up enough so you can tell me a few things? I shall strive bravely, uh, between libations, of course. Uh, what would you like to know? Did Alice Chambers have a visitor last night? Uh, yes. What time? Shortly after dinner. Did you see him go into her room? In a manner of speaking, yes. You knew him? Quite well. Well, who was it? Myself. What? Uh, it was my custom to call on her to exchange a few pleasantries at the close of the day. Oh, great. Now, look, that's not what I mean. Did you see anybody else near her room? Uh, no. Uh, well, I guess that's that. Uh, of course, the rather questionable-looking ex-ophthalmic individual who asked me for directions to a room later in the evening might have been somebody who would... Well, wait probably... a minute. Let's have that again. I was taking my usual evening stroll, a short ex-ophthalmic... Oh, reduce it to the vernacular, will you? Very well. His eyes protruded slightly. Oh. Could be the same button-eyed gent who slugged Freilich's cousin Julius Sachs. Freilich? Julius Sachs? I'm afraid I've not had the pleasure of Skip either it. of these. So Button Eyes was trying to find Alice Chambers. Looked like he found her all right and killed her. 
Well, that still doesn't help me much. He obviously got the trunk, so... Trunk? I... What trunk? Uh, it used to belong to a gent named Fralick. His cousin Julia sold it to a junk dealer who peddled it to Alice Chambers. And now five will get you ten. Button eyes has it, and I'm too late. Oh, but I assure you, that is quite impossible. What do you mean? Well, it is a well-established law of physics that an object cannot be in two places at once. I still don't get you. How could your ex-ophthalmic friend have possession of the trunk when Alice Chambers sold it five days ago? Sold it? You know, Professor, trying to get information out of you is like riding the merry-go-round. I have to go three laps each time before I grab the brass ring. A colorful analogy. Who did Alice sell it to? A friend of hers, a dancer named Yvette. Ballet dancer? In a manner of speaking. You know where Yvette is? I do. Good. Give me her address. I'll run over and talk to her. Oh, but I fear that would be quite impossible. To run over and talk to Yvette would be to defy several laws of now, gravity. Now, don't start that again. Where is Yvette? Uh, four days ago, she left for London. London? Oh, brother. This is really turning into an obstacle race. Okay, Professor, thanks. We finally made it. The pleasure was all mine, sir. It has been a most stimulating conversation. I hope that we may look forward to another one. Sure, sure. Sometime when I've got three hours to kill and I want to find out what day it is, I'll be around. I grab the next plane for London. When I arrive, I check the newspapers and finally find the name of the theater where Yvette is dancing. It's uh, in the seamy section of the city, and when I get inside, I realize why the professor said she was a ballet dancer in a manner of speaking. I slip around backstage while she's doing her dance and find her dressing room, but there's no trunk. So it looks like Button Eyes is still ahead of me. I turn to go out, then I see something hurtling through the air at me. A flat iron. I drop to one knee and it sails past me into the mirror. Hey. Hey, yourself. Ah, hello, Yvette. What is this, Grand Central Station? I'm sorry to barge into your dressing room like this, but Look, I... I'm getting a little tired of this routine. What? Twice already today there have been guys snooping around my room. Twice? Yeah. Wait, uh, was one of them a short guy with button eyes? I don't know. I didn't get a decent look at either of them. But if they're friends of yours, you tell them for me that I they're don't like them. They're not exactly friends of mine, Yvette. Here, you'd better take a look at my credentials. Oh, so you're a government agent, hmm? But I still don't see why you're snooping around my dressing room. I'm looking for the trunk Alice Chambers sold you back in the States last week. Oh, that. I lent it to Joe Feeney the night before last. Whoever he is. Oh, he's my boyfriend. He's with the Flying Feenies, um, acrobats. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Well, where are they acrobatting now? Denmark. Oh, brother. This trunk has really got legs. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, but uh, what's with the trunk, anyway? Look. The junk dealer back in New York told me that he'd had two keys made for the trunk. Yeah, Alice gave me both of them when she sold me the trunk. You still got them? Sure, one of them. Uh, I gave the other one to Joe when I lent him the trunk. Well, I guess my next stop is the Flying Feenies in Denmark. Now, look, these two characters that you saw snooping around your dressing room earlier... Yeah? You think they would have any way of knowing that the trunk is in Denmark now? How could they if I don't even know them or know who they are? Well, then it looks like I'm one jump ahead of button eyes for a change, but I still don't get who the other snooper could be. Well, I still don't get what's so hot about that trunk. I... Hold it. What's the matter? Quiet. What stopped me is a slight sound outside the dressing room. I ease over to the door and jerk it open. Then I spot a little guy scrambling away. There's enough light to tell me it's button eyes. I take after him. But he pops behind some of the flats backstage, and when I get there, he's gone. I scour the whole backstage area, but there's no sight of him. Finally, I give up, start heading back to Yvette's dressing room, and then suddenly I hear something swishing through the air. I look up. A sandbag is hurtling down at me. I dive to one side, but it hits me a glancing blow on the side of the head. It sends me down for the count. listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Steve, Steve. Oh, oh Steve. What? Oh, is that? Oh, Steve, you're lucky. You want to bet? Oh, if that sandbag had hit you square. Uh, the way my head feels right now, it couldn't have made much difference, believe me. The guy you were chasing got away, hmm? Yeah, he's got a head start on me again. Oh. Incidentally, 
You mind telling me where you were when that sandbag dropped on me? Oh, in my dressing room. You sure about that? Of course I'm sure. Why? Oh, skip it. Brother, this head of mine will probably be throbbing louder than the engines on that plane. What plane? The one I'm taking to Denmark to talk to the flying feedies. <laughs> The Flying Feenies. This is an act. It is a catastrophe. No, their act doesn't stop the show. Look, all I know is that when I arrived here in Denmark, I learned that you'd booked them here at your theater, and I want to talk to them. You are wrong when you say that act does not stop the show, Mr. Mitchell. It stopped mine cold. With the Flying Feenies, I could not draw flies. I still want to talk to... Hey, wait a minute. Are you trying to say that they're not here anymore? They lasted just one performance. Then I gave them, as you say, the hammer. Oh, great. So now I'm on the merry-go-round again. You wouldn't happen to know where they're playing now. Such an act as this, you would not peddle to your worst enemy. So? So I peddle them to my worst enemy. Who? Max Gruber. He runs a traveling carnival. I have never forgotten the so-called talking dog he booked here once. Where is his carnival now? Somewhere in Holland, I think, if the Flying Feenies haven't put him out of business yet. So I hopped down to Holland. So far, this deal's been strictly a six-day bicycle race with Button Eyes always one lap ahead of me. Now, I've got somebody else to worry about, the other guy that Yvette said was snooping around in her dressing room in London. I start checking in Holland for the Feenies, and at this point, it wouldn't surprise me to see him swinging on the nearest windmill. Well, four hours later, I locate the traveling carnival in Rotterdam. I find their tent, and I go inside, and there at last are the flying Feenies in front of me, racked up in a pyramid, practicing their act. Hi. Quite a pyramid. Which one of you is Joe Feeney? I am. Here on the bottom. I, hey, Henry, that's my backbone. So what do you want from me? So get up on my shoulder a little. Oh. Uh, 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 what can I do for you? Well, uh, My name's Mitchell, a government agent from the States. Where's that trunk you borrowed from your vet in London? I don't see it around this tent anywhere. It's over at the hotel room, the falling. Have you got a key to the trunk? Sure, right here in my pocket. Yeah, I'll get it. Hey, right. Joe, I'm leaving. Hey, Joe, hey, hey. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I step over the sprawling Feenies and head to their hotel room in town. The room is dark. I start to search for the light switch, but before I can make it, something awfully hard connects over my left ear. And for the second time in 24 hours, I take a dive. Oh. Uh, how about this character? He wants to come over the room to look at the trunk, so I let him, and what happens? Well, I'm... Uh... Oh, Joe Feeney. I thought there was something fishy about him in London, Joe. Hey, is that? Yeah. Hey, what are you doing here in Holland? I decided to come over and uh, soup up the act a little. Pretty convenient time for you to arrive. What do you mean? This is the second time I've gotten conked on the head, and both times when I come out of it, there's little Yvette. Hey, look, don't change the subject, buddy. If you got any private little murders to commit, that's your business. But I don't like you using my room for them. Murders? What are you talking about? For instance, that corpse over there in the corner. Huh? Hey, wait. So, I finally caught up with button eyes. And from the looks of that knife in his back, I'd say I was about four inches too late. Like I say, buddy, if you had it in for the guy, well and good. But... Just hold it a minute, buddy. I don't see that trunk in this room anywhere. I should be in the closet. Hmm. Yeah, here it is, all right. But I'm too late again. The trunk's open and empty, including the false bottom. False bottom? What are you talking about? I'd surprise you, Yvette. Why shouldn't it? Hey, look, I don't know what this is all about. Joe, did you keep this trunk locked? Why, yeah. Yeah. What's the matter? If the lock on this trunk had been picked, there'd probably be a few small scratches on the metal around it. So? So there aren't any scratches. That means the trunk was probably opened with a key. What are you getting at? I'll start from the beginning, Yvette. Button Eyes was after the trunk right from the start. He knew what was in that false bottom but it's beginning to look right now like somebody else has dealt himself or herself into the deal along the way. Look. Somebody who figured that whatever was in the trunk must be pretty valuable. I still don't see what that's got to do with the keys. I'm coming to that, Feeney. This trunk originally belonged to a gent named Freilich. His cousin, Julius Sachs, lost the key in New York, so he sold the trunk to a junk dealer who had two more keys made. Alice Chambers gave you both keys when she sold you the trunk, Yvette. Sure she did, but... Joe here gave me one of the keys a little while ago. 
but you still got the other key. And that sort of puts the finger on now, you. Now, wait a minute. Now, look, buddy. Yvette couldn't have killed this guy. She was with me when we discovered you here on the floor just now. Well, the two of you could be working together. You know, you're talking like you've got a hole in your head. I told you there was a second guy snooping around my dressing room in London. He's probably the one you're after. Yeah, you sure there was a second guy? Yeah. Bit, or did you dream up that story for a good cover? Now, look. I heard in London that Joe and his act weren't doing so hot. So I came over here to join him, figuring uh, maybe I could help. As soon as my plane landed, I came right here to the hotel. Then I ran into Joe in the lobby just as he was coming upstairs to the room. So, even if I knew what this is all about, I couldn't have had time to knife that guy and take whatever was in the bottom of that trunk. Okay, that maybe you're telling me the truth and maybe you're lying. Right now, I'm going to find out which. <laughs> I pick up the phone and check with the airport and the desk clerk downstairs, and my case against Yvette falls right on its face. She didn't get to the hotel until after I'd gotten hit over the head, and the same holds true for Joe Feeney, too, so now I'm fresh out of Leeds. Then a wild idea hits me. I start thinking of a character back in New York. I put through a call to the commissioner back in the States and tell him what I want him to check. A half hour later, he calls me back, and what he says doesn't surprise me. Looks like you had the right hunch, Steve. We found out that he left for Europe right after you did. Looks like he's been on your tail all the way. Yeah, he finally caught up with me and Button Eyes here in the hotel room. You think he's got the buzz bomb plans now, Steve? Five will get you ten, he has. Any idea where he is? Probably waiting for the next plane out of here. See you later, Commissioner. Joe, you got a car outside? Yeah. Warm it up. I'm going to call the airport to check on some departing planes. Are you going somewhere? No, and I want to make sure that somebody else isn't either. Mitchell, there's a plane over there getting ready to take off. Yeah, that's probably the one I'm after. Thanks for the lift, Joe. Eh, passenger's still getting on. I Looking just... for me, Mitchell? What? Ah, oh, hello, Julius. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was. I thought you might be, so it seemed better for me to find you. I feel much safer with my gun in your bag. Needless to say, you've got those buzz bomb plans in your satchel there. But of course, come on. Where to? On the corner of the building. Okay. Sure all figures, Julius. You didn't realize your cousin's trunk was so valuable until Button Eyes beat you up trying to find out where it was. Then you decided to follow it up yourself. You caught up with Button Eyes in the hotel room and killed him? And I'm quite certain these plans I took from the trunk can be sold to interested parties at a uh, very fat price. Here, this is far enough, Mitchell. In the shadows now, and with the noise of the airplane engines, I doubt that one small shot from this automatic would even be heard. It was a key that pegged you, Julius. If that had one, I had the other. Then I remembered you telling me that you'd lost the original key. By that time, I had also realized the trunk must be of considerable value, Mitchell. You should uh, hardly expect me to reveal that I still have another key. Would hardly, you? Hardly, Julius. Mitchell, my plane is taking off momentarily, and I regret that I must terminate our little conversation right now. His gun jams harder against my back, and I know that he's going to pull the trigger any second now. Then I remember what he said a minute ago. The gun is an automatic. That gives me an idea, a real long shot, but my only chance. Suddenly I throw my weight backward, driving him against the wall. Behind him, the gun is wedged between my back and his chest. I strain backward, keeping the pressure on the muzzle with my back. An automatic won't fire when the slide is pushed back. Get away way from me, Mitch. Sheriff tries to shove me forward, but I brace myself. I know that the instant the pressure is taken off the gun, it'll fire. I start sweating. I can't keep the pressure on much longer. My feet are slipping on the concrete. Suddenly, I raise one of them and let him have a heel in the shin. He relaxes his hold on the gun for an instant, just long enough. I bend over, reach back between my legs, grab his foot, and yank it forward. The slot whistles over my back, and Julius' head plunks back into the wall. Oh! I'll take the gun now, Julius. Oh, Have the satchel. My head. Yeah, I guess that wall must be pretty hard, all right, but you've got no kicks coming. Uh, what do you mean? After all, you had me bucking a stone wall oh. all the way in this deal. I'm just returning the compliment the hard way. Oh. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time, when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment.
Murder's Assignment came to you from Hollywood. For more mysteries, stay tuned for The Man Called X on NBC. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.